Um, so yeah, welcome everyone to uh, Driving E-Commerce Growth. Uh, this is a webinar that's all about maximizing the impact of your marketing budget. Um, the aim of today is to help and give you some actionable advice that you can then take away and hopefully take it forward and make a difference to the performance of your, your website uh, and your business. Um, with me today, uh, I've got Craig, who is another member of the Trunk BBI team. And we've also got Rich, uh, uh, who is one of our clients actually from Halfords. It was very kindly offered to join us on this webinar today. Um, and we'll do some quick introductions. So um, I'm Performance Director at Trunk BBI. Um, I've been uh, in the agency world for about 10 years across a few different cities. Um, I'm responsible for looking at our clients' challenges, their problems, their difficulties, their markets, and understanding how we can drive performance and putting the right strategies together for our clients to deliver against their objectives. Um, I've worked with a range of different e-commerce brands over the years from uh, the really big e-commerce brands, uh, household names, all the way through to more niche kind of startup and challenger brands. Uh, and hopefully I can bring some insight to this that's going to help everyone kind of grow their business moving forward. Yes, yeah, so I'm Craig. I, uh, I head up the performance marketing department. Um, again, worked with numerous e-commerce e brands across the year with my previous role being at a, an e-commerce uh, specific agency. Um, so every client we worked with there was, was an e-commerce brand ranging from kind of £500 monthly paid search budgets all the way up to kind of, you know, the hundreds of thousands that, that the big brands command. Um, so yeah, my focus has been on paid media mostly, but look after the whole of performance marketing at Trump BBI. Uh, and, and I'm Rich, so I've previously spent most of my career agency side, uh, and I've now come onto the, the light side and the dark side, depending on your, your point of view. Um, and I've been at Halfords for, for two years, where I head up all things SEO at, at Halfords. So we've got a, a team that look after the retail business, the garage business, and our ever expanded kind of mobile expert business as well. Uh, as I mentioned, I started in agency side as a, as a kind of junior SEO. So I'm at PVC, analytics, and a little bit of social. I sold SEO, I sold PVC. So I've been in agency life for quite a while now. I've kind of tried my hand at client side, but eventually I came back to, I think, what my kind of true calling is in, uh, in SEO. So I'm back to doing good old SEO. I like it. The dark side of the client world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we will go into that. <laughs> um, I think just to kind of kick us off, though, um, I think the last kind of six to 12 months in particular has been a real challenging period for businesses. There's been a huge amount of economic turmoil. There is continual interest rate rises that are infecting uh, the cost of living crisis. Uh, and we know that from our clients and from the wider kind of uh, e-commerce world that there are some pretty challenging marketing budgets out there at the moment um, and we get asked a lot of common questions we get asked how do I increase revenue how do I get a better ROI from marketing channels that I'm, uh, I'm pushing out how do I increase relevant traffic to drive the right type of user to my website and to get them to convert and ultimately in in certain sectors how do I thrive in a very competitive sector how can I be seen and be visible and grow my business when there are some huge players in that market. And these are really common questions that we see and, and hopefully today we're gonna to help answer some of these and, and give you some insight how we would have looked to approach that. Um, as I said, this webinar is all about giving you actionable tips and advice that you can take away and go and talk to your internal teams, go and talk to your agencies uh, and hopefully implement to go and move the needle slightly on how your marketing performance is at the moment. Um, in terms of what we'll cover today, so we're going to break this webinar down into kind of three or four sections. The first section is going to be uh, very much around Rich taking a lead and talking you through a little bit around the growth that Halfords have achieved working with Trunk BBI, the strategy that they've implemented uh, and some of the results that they've seen off the back of that. We'll then talk through some of our top tips for helping organic search thrive and grow and maximize performance through that channel. Um, Craig will then chat through some of our top tips for paid media growth and maximizing the performance of paid media channels. And then time depending, dependent on how we get on today. Uh, if we have time, we'll have some uh, questions at the end. If you do have any questions as we go through that you want to kind of flag, there is a function on Zoom for you to be able to ask questions. Uh, and as we see them pop up, we'll hopefully be able to answer them as we go through. So over to you, Rich, if that's all right. Cool. Um, so I suppose in terms of some context for the, the entire category of the business, lots of you will probably know how it's are and you're dependent on how you've dealt with the business in the past. You'll see if there's a traditional retail store or a, an auto center or a garage business. 
Um, the tyres part of the business has been going for multiple years and it was actually separate sites and, and things like that. But in kind of 2020, Calpers, it was just before my time, decided to uh, kind of tackle the, the, the tyre market and, and, and aim for more growth in this area. Uh, so the ambition is to effectively be number one in, in the tyre space. Um, and I'm sure uh, many of our competitors have the same sort of ambition, but Alpers really kind of took that on upon themselves to, to kind of drive those areas. Uh, so there was lots of acquisitions, lots of growth and, and lots of changes. The biggest change that we had was we had a separate website for tyres, which was Halpers Auto Centres. That merged into Halpers.com and now it's all one all singing or dancing uh, website, which obviously all the SEOs on the call or people who dabble in those areas will know that's a, a much better place for us to be in. We can grow those areas and we can really kind of uh, target them much better. Um, we then engaged with BBI just before I joined. They were already working on the account, working on certain tyre categories help us drive growth there with the ambition of trying to gain as much market share as we can. We then implemented a brand new strategy and it led to the, some of the results you can see on the screen uh, at the moment. Obviously, we'll talk about what we did, how we did some of those things and, and what kind of strategies we implemented, but the results kind of speak for themselves. Um, and there's some really nice graphs to show how you can kind of represent these sort of things back to, to your uh, counterparts, stakeholders and, and agencies and stuff. So um, that is a, an accurate representation of us right now um, as we're kind of growing in our visibility and, uh, and our kind of uh, aim to be number one in those spaces. Um, and actually working with the BBI team, and particularly as, as you guys probably work with agencies yourselves, um, a lot of what we do is, is fun and enjoyable and we all work together quite collaboratively. Um, so it is really great to, to kind of be part of those sort of things. So this is kind of basically where we kind of start as a business. So helpers aren't new to tyres. And as I mentioned, we have a separate website and, and our ambition was to kind of take more of the market share in this, in this space. Um, and we effectively started kind of fourth, fifth in, in, in this kind of space. Helpers also own a few other businesses in this area as well. So it's not just helpers.com, but our goal was an SEO team and, and the people that work in my team work with the agency with BBI is that we wanted to basically grow those areas um, and you can see we started kind of fourth in the visibility areas and time black circles and, and some of those other brands but now we're pleased to say that with the growth that we've had in terms of the sessions and, and how the tire business now performs we're now second and we're very closely approaching quick bit. so um, obviously for us that's great it's nice to see that we can move up in those kind of rankings bump some of the other competitors down and take more of that share um, and we're really close to some of the one spot. And Andy reliably informed me, reckon, in a few months. We'll <laughs> so, yeah, famous um, last words there, Rich. <laughs> and I'm pretty recording that. So I know, yeah, so, there's no going back. Yeah. Um, we'll be yeah. held to that. <laughs> but you can just see clearly you know, the growth is, is, is there to see from a visibility perspective, as well as some of the other harder metrics like sessions and, and, and revenue and bookings. Um, and obviously, from a any stakeholder position or any any business that engage with any agency, it's always key to have return on investment. Um, and in terms of the climate that we're currently up against, budgets are strict, budgets are tight, and, and we're very similar in health goods, and we want to make every spend work as hard as it possibly can. Um, so it's great to see these sort of numbers. There's always an element where it's going to be strong in, in, in SEO, but to be this strong is probably um, goes against the grain in these sort of areas. And that's you know a collaborative effort between all the parties involved and, and helping to drive this growth. And actually, as a business, tyres is incredibly successful for how it's now than it ever has been. Um, so it's not just helping SEO, it's helping the entire business, helping to grow, helping our network of garages improve. Um, and that's becoming a kind of a, a saver for us as a business now. So the strategy was um, nothing too out of the ordinary around this world, but really we just focused on where we could move the needle and what we could do and how we could influence things. Um, like many businesses, we struggle with some elements such as technical or changing the way the websites work. Our CMS can often be restrictive and we can only do certain things, but Trump BBI really pushed us to try and do different things than we were doing before rather than just stick content in a footer and hope it works. We kind of pushed ourselves to be a bit more engaging. But the first step as anything would be to prioritize what we're going to look for, what the search opportunity is. John BBI did a ton of research. We've got a couple of examples of, I think it was you know, eight odd thousand kind of core keywords that we wanted to target. And we really segmented those into different groups from tire sizes right through to, to tire types and tires by vehicle. The next phase was then improving and expanding what content we had at the moment. So we've got a ton of content already. We weren't starting from ground zero, um, but we really wanted to make sure that we optimized that as, as 
thoroughly as we could before we started to go into new areas and really get a good foundation. And that's where we spent most of our strategy in the first few months of, of working with these guys. And then the final one was just improving the, the UX and the, the templates rather than just working what we had. Think BBI often did UX designs, fed back that to the to our UX team internally, and we looked at what we could and couldn't do, what limitations and restrictions we had. How could we just really make that content work harder so it wasn't just seen as SEO content, which is often what we're fighting against sometimes. Um, and here's just a couple of examples of that. So it, this might not look like anything revolutionary, but to us at help us, this was quite a big step to actually get content above the fold, which you know some some businesses still struggle with today to kind of see if this SEO content that doesn't really do much for users and doesn't really engage. But we really wanted to challenge that thinking. Now we kind of always can do these sort of things. And actually, as an internal business, when I first joined, it was a it was it was a challenge to get some of the stakeholders to come on board with those ideas. Now we've got complete buy-in, goodwill, and a lot of rapport with a lot of them to do these sort of things because we've shown the results it can have. Uh, so it's a, it's been a real win, not the tire, but also for help us that we can do these sort of things in other categories uh, and hopefully see the same sort of success. Yeah, thanks for that, Rich. I think you know from a trunk BBI perspective, working with Halfords as well. I think it's been quite refreshing where we've been able to work together collaboratively to, to drive this performance forward. I think a lot of agencies and a lot of in-house teams sometimes clash with what the priority should be, uh, where here we work together to identify what we could change, how we could go about that and, and really move that needle forward. Uh, and I think that's been key to driving some of the success that you see in these slides. Um, I'm going to kind of move on to uh, off the back of that organic search uh, and hopefully give some tips and advice around what you can do to help move your performance forward in a, in a similar manner to uh, what you've just seen for Halfords there. So a common question we get asked when we speak to uh, clients and prospects is, well, I know that if I spend X amount in a paid media channel, I can get X amount return investment immediately. Uh, and there's always a challenge around the the foreseen benefit of organic search and the investment that's needed into organic search. I think just to highlight why it's such a key channel, 43% of kind of e-commerce traffic comes from organic search and in Google in particular. 24% of all e-commerce transactions are directly linked to organic search. And 70% of Google searches result in a top five organic click, which means that, you know, as a channel, it is key to driving e-commerce performance. It's key in terms of visibility and people that are lower in the funnel doing that research and awareness phase and people that are then in that transactional cycle and looking to actually complete their purchase. Um, so what we're ultimately here saying is just don't neglect organic search. It's a key channel uh, in the in the life cycle for e-commerce sites. Um, a common challenge is that there's so many signals and so little budget, and it's a case of where do you start and how do you navigate all these different signals that Google look at in their algorithm to understand a website, determine its quality and determine how you should rank. I think at the last count of the quality rater guidelines that Google published has 206 different signals listed. And some of those signals are really small signals that will hold a very small percentage um, of the overall algorithm. And some of those are much bigger, but it's very hard to know where to start and what to concentrate on. Um, but don't worry, we're gonna hopefully bring a little bit of clarity to that. What we've done as an agency is we've taken different studies that are out there in the public domain that look at what agencies across the globe have outlined has helped move their clients' organic search performance forward. We've taken the data from those different um, studies and we've aggregated that to understand what actually impacts organic search performance across the globe, with, particularly with a focus on Google here. And what we can see is that technical SEO, the infrastructure of a website, how quickly it loads, um, that is somewhere between kind of 19 to 25% of the weighting of performance. The big section here that really has had the biggest impact is content and on-site content. That includes the content that you're actually writing, so the quality of that content, but then some factors like the user experience of that content, how it's displayed on a page, looking at um, the engagement metrics uh, and how, how engaging and how thought out that content is. And that takes somewhere between kind of 38 and 44% of that, that impact. We then have backlinks. So backlinks have, have been a, a challenging subject, I think, for Google over the last kind of 10 to 15 years. At one point, it was very spammy, very easy to manipulate Google search and 
simply go out and buy some links and you'll see your performance follow. It's moved on a lot from there. Um, it's now all about relevancy and the quality of those links rather than quantity. Um, and it's roughly 18 to 21% uh, of sites are impacted uh, by backlinks. And then there's a few other signals like how big your brand is uh, and the search volume associated to that, and then some, some further off-site signals. Um, but I guess what does that actually mean? So to bring that back into kind of three key areas, our message here is don't neglect technical SEO. It's still important. It took 19 to 25% of that kind of benchmarking that we've just seen. And it is the foundation of a website. I always use the analogy that technical SEO is like building the foundations of a house. You can invest in content, you can invest in backlinks, you can invest in changing the UX. But if you've fundamentally got some pretty crucial errors in your technical SEO, you are going to ultimately see other things crumble and not reach the success factors that you would want it to. The second part that we would recommend is to really invest in quality. You've just seen it from what Rich chatted through in that Halfords case study, where you can add good quality targeted content that aligns to what Google's looking to see. You will see results off the back of that. Uh, and content is king. That phrase is still appropriate right now. And um, the third part is that backlinks are still incredibly important. It's not as big a signal as it once was, um, but backlinks still need to be regularly acquired and pushed into the website. Now, that needs to be from relevant and high quality sources and publications that are naturally acquired, not paid for links, not going out there and just spamming lots of affiliate links into a site. Google understands that they are lower quality and are not going to move that needle for you. So our first tip really is related to that first point around technical SEO. And it's about, let's actually not get that technical. Um, and this is quite a common problem that we see as an agency. And I'm sure Rich, you'll have probably seen this as well, uh, working at Halfords and at your time in an agency, um, where you've got three different distinct departments. You've got the agency that are telling you a, a complete and full list of every technical issue that you've got on your site from you've got some redirects that are going through loops all the way through to that you, your schema isn't displaying properly and that you need to fix it. You've then got a marketing team in-house that will uh, understand the majority of those recommendations and see the benefit of them, but they will know that there are other stakeholders in the business, that there are other departments and teams that they need to bring into that loop and make sure that they're on board with those recommendations. A website often isn't just for marketing, it's for other departments too. And then there'll be a, a development and IT team that ultimately are responsible for implementing some of those kind of changes and, and structural uh, elements that might need changing. And the hard bit is sat in the middle. It's about, we call it getting shit done. Um, that's the hard bit and getting alignment between everyone. Um, and our kind of takeaway from that is that rather than focusing on everything, focus on what you have the ability to change. Is there a question, Craig? There is a question. Um, so Katrina Ellison has asked, when talking about content and quality, is there space for chat GPT in producing on-site content? It's a good question. And uh, it's something that we are toying with as an agency, and I'm sure, Rich, you've toyed with. And, and uh, I think chat GPT is a fantastic tool, and you've got to be very careful with it. Um, it's only as good as the information that you provide it. Um, when we create content for Halfords, the way that we would work is that we have our keyword research. We then create a, a really comprehensive content brief that we give to our content writers. That content brief would be the same level of insight and detail that would be needed to give to ChatGPT to get it to formulate some quality content for you. The key thing with that is that once you get that content back from ChatGPT, you actually need to hum a human touch on it. You need to make sure that it's factually accurate. It's written in a way that aligns to your tone of voice and the way that you would want to portray yourself as a brand. Um, and once you've done that, you can then utilize that content and, and use it on your site. Google has recently come out actually and said that um, AI generated content will be treated in the same way as human created content. It will judge the quality and the relevancy of it in relation to your product or business rather than that's AI generated content and it shouldn't be as shouldn't be regarded in the same way. So there's definitely a place for chat GPT, but it's about making sure you give it the right information to generate the content that's going to be good enough quality for you. I think where we're using it at Halfords is is more the 
um, kind of ideation and, and inspirational stuff. And, you know, when you've got to write 50 meta descriptions and you want some help to inspire some ideas, we feed that into chat GPT as, a, as some of the tests we've been doing to say, give me some meta descriptions. And then we take them away and we get a copywriter to actually make them more relevant or to optimize them further or to just give them some more uniqueness. Um, I don't, you know, we've done some tests where we've, I've asked one of the copywriters to do some content and I've asked chat, chat GPT to do it. And nine times out of 10, the copywriter does a much better job because it's got, it's got a better context and a better understanding. But we're really using it just for ideas and just to get some juices flowing sometimes as well. So, so yeah, but no content on how it is AI generated as of yet, but we shall see if that continues. <laughs> um, so going back to kind of tech SEO, like I said before, it's about focusing very much on what you actually have the ability to change. Um, the simple things that you should have access to give you the greatest opportunity. So I would have thought that if you are an e-commerce manager or a marketing manager, then you should have access to the CMS of your website where you can amend product descriptions, you can change category page descriptions, you can add long form content to the site in pre-built templates. Now, a big thing that we've seen success with as an agency is focusing very much on your internal linking strategy. And this is about making sure that you've got the right internal links in the right content in the right places on your site to help spread that equity around the site and to help Google and users find that content more efficiently. Doing this can have a huge impact on your organic performance and really help to for Google to understand the relation between products, the relation between categories, uh, and help users and Google understand the structure and architecture of your site. So focusing on this should be an easy win for anyone on this, on this webinar if you've got CMS access. The second part is um, images. So e-commerce websites are obviously very image rich. They are one of the biggest uh, speed uh, implicators. Um, often a lot of images will be uploaded in JPEG format or PNG format which often, you know, seemingly 374 KB isn't a big file, but in the world of search, it can be. Um, and this is an example where images have been converted into an X-Gen format, WebP, where it's essentially th um, shaved off around 66% of that file size. The quality isn't impacted. The uh, file loads quicker uh, on your site. Uh, and this can really help to move that needle of site speed forward, which one impacts organic search, but two also impacts your conversion rate. If your site loads quicker, if people see the images and the content on product pages quicker, then there is a higher chance that they're gonna convert on your site rather than bouncing back into the search results. So again, this in theory should be, if you have CMS access, a quick win that you can implement. Some sites and some e-commerce platforms have this built in. So if there's anyone here that's on a, a Shopify site, um, they automatically convert any image you upload into WebP. So if you upload a JPEG, it'll automatically convert. If you are using something uh, like Umbraco and it's a, a more of a custom built solution, then this is often something that you're relying on a developer to do or you manually have to do. But it is absolutely worth the time and investment to get your site speed up to help organic search and conversion rates. The next part is another really simple strategy, uh, which is optimizing your redirects and creating a redirect strategy. So um, when we talk around redirect strategy, that's very much around what you do with discontinued products on your site, what you do with out of stock products, what you do with pages that have inbound links to them that have equity from external sources that are gonna help support SEO and, and organic performance. Um, and I put a, a quick example in here. So. If you were a, uh, a retailer that was selling backpacks and you had a, a black backpack by North Face um, and that was discontinued, often what you see a lot of the time is that as soon as that becomes discontinued and you've run out of stock, that page will be redirected back into the category page for rucksacks. Um, now, that's fine in theory, but is there actually a better way? do you leave that discontinued product live on your site so that it maintains the organic rankings for a short time and then put other products on that page to help signpost them into more relevant products? Or do you look to redirect that actually into a similar product so that when people land on it, they go and find something that might not necessarily be quite what they were expecting, but something that is very similar to that product? Um, and with this example, there are 
10 or 15 North Face backpacks that are black, have the same uh, general aesthetic to them. And that could be a really great way to make sure that people are still finding a product that they might actually go and purchase. Um, and then finally, pages with kind of inbound links to them. You want to make sure that they're being redirected into the best possible place to support that product category. So if you have products that have several links to them from high authority domains, then putting that into another product might actually help that performance. Putting it into the category might help further support that category and its overall performance. So there needs to be a strategy around how you deal with these things and factors. And getting that right can really help to, to maximize performance from organic. Our next tip is around spending time on your keyword strategy. So Rich touched on this quite a lot around some of the work we've done with Halfords, where I think we looked at 8,000-ish keywords related to tires, which is, is fairly granular, but it gives you a really solid picture around that landscape. Um, and understanding your kind of landscape and the opportunities is absolutely key to success with organic search. If you don't do the prep upfront, then you're ultimately setting yourself up to fail with the content and everything that you put on the site. So our key kind of takeaways here are identify keywords that are relevant to you as a business. Look at the different category of products that you sell. Look at the different individual products you sell. Look at long tail search volume. Look at short tail search volume. Once you've done that, categorize your keywords. You can see in this screenshot here that for Halfords, we categorize them by different topics. So we categorize them by, in this example, tire pressure and everything that's related to tire pressure. Look at the monthly search volume of your keywords and understand which ones have the biggest opportunity to deliver sessions into your site if you were to perform well. Look at the ones which have the lowest opportunity. Um, look at who actually ranks well for those keywords and who doesn't um, and look at where you rank currently as well to understand how you can take inspiration from those sites that are performing well and are ranking above you and look at if there's opportunities to jump into position zero with featured snippets if there are then that could be an easy win to go and change the layout of your content and structure of your content to suddenly jump into position zero and once you've done all of that kind of work and put that into a format that is legible and makes sense, you can then start to identify where you've got the greatest opportunity to deliver growth. I think what's great about that is, um, particularly from a, a client perspective, obviously I used to do a lot of this with the client, but now I don't have the luxury of being able to, to spend time on this. Despite having a small in-house team, we just don't have the capabilities to, or the time to, to do a lot of these stuff. And if I'm being completely honest, period research isn't a favourite subject to, to spend time on. It's quite dry. So <laughs> it's not like that job we are spending the time doing that and then giving us this information so that we can discuss it and challenge it. And actually, when we did this exercise, there were so many keywords in there that we never really considered. We didn't have places for them. There wasn't the, the right sort of content structure. And it made us just think differently about how our website was working. Um, and it took away the stress of having to do this ourselves because we'd probably only do it a very small detail like this and probably not categorize and not consider feature snippets. So it's really advantageous having an agency spend the time on this and you can go and do some of the other things. Um, and when we talk around categorization, that isn't just categorization of kind of product categories or keyword categories, but also starting to understand where those keywords have an impact in that user journey. So long tail search keywords, which are more kind of question based searches that may be multiple words in a sentence or in a phrase, those are often more around kind of informational intent that are trying to do research about products or about um, services or, or solutions. You then have kind of that research and consideration phase where somebody knows what they're looking for and are starting to look at different retailers to find that. So it's about what keywords target that type of search. We've then got kind of conversion and transactional intent keywords where it's all about okay, well, which keywords are actually going to go and deliver that commercial value to us as a business and where are we going to get those sales and revenue coming into the business? And then there are follow-up uh, kind of keywords and searches that are all about retention and making sure that customers come back to purchase again and giving additional kind of insight and, and content to them. And understanding where those keywords fit in this journey is key to maximizing the return that you see from organic search. If you can understand where you have the greatest opportunity to perform and grow in organic search and you can understand out of that area which ones are going to have the biggest impact on 
driving people to your site and then converting them on site, that is a really powerful tool for you to be able to take forward and, and create the right content. And ultimately, you know, you want to focus on those keywords that we're going to deliver commercial growth. It's what we have done with Rich at Halfords and it's delivered some of those stats that you saw at the start. And these are just a couple of examples where when we analyzed search volume and we understood, you know, how people are behaving in search, what they're searching for, we can start to see that there's a lot of search volume around two different sectors here, around vehicle brands and tires, keywords related to that. So people searching for BMW 3 Series tires as a keyword that Halfords had no content for and were not actually getting any search uh, volume or sessions into the site from. So we put a bit of a focus on creating pages for each of the different manufacturers. We've then seen that there was search volume for people that are looking for their uh, actual uh, tire size um, and uh, tire tread pattern. So really glamorous, um, 215 by 45 by R17 as a search term um, is not necessarily something that you directly think of when you think around Halfords, but by creating content for that and targeting those keywords, we can actually start to capture those people that are actually probably going to be very high up in that funnel ready to convert because they're looking for that specific tread pattern. That actually happened to me. Did it? So I had a nail go through my tire. I searched for that. And then... Did you go to Halfords? I did go to yeah. Halfords, yeah. That's good. Yeah. And I think that just is a great example of how we actually didn't realise we were missing those customers. And the biggest problem we had at Halfords when I first started working from BBI is we couldn't get this content into the website quickly enough. Um, and I'm sure you guys all have the same sort of problems. You've got barriers to kind of break down and get people on side. And it probably took us a couple of months, maybe three, four months before we got any of the content really going. But once we've got that momentum, we could create all these tire size pages, which my predecessor couldn't do, his predecessor couldn't do. And for years, we had all these gaps. Now we've kind of proved that it can work and we can kind of capitalize on those. And there's a young lad in my team that he's now just running away with these tire sizes. And for some reason, he absolutely does work on them. So it's great for him to break them. I mean, my car is more exciting than probably I do in, in some respects, but he's then, we've got, you know, close to a hundred of these now that are all optimized and, and kind of doing the job that they need to do for exactly like Craig mentioned there, those people that read the tire size, Google it, and hopefully they find us first, second or third, which we just didn't have before. Um, so it's been a real good success that one. Cool. And the next SEO tip is around content and making sure that you're adding quality content. So, um, our top tip here really is improve your current content before you look to add more content. Um, if you have poor quality content on the site and then you're adding really well written and optimized content, it's ultimately going to weigh you down and drag you down. Um, and that content that you have written specifically to perform and to help grow your business and, and search performance is not going to reach its maximum performance or, or where it could reach. Um, so really focus on what you have already in existence first, get that right, get that to the quality it needs to be before you then start to expand it out and, and build it out. And that's very similar to what we did for Halfords. We looked in, at their existing content. We saw the pages that they had, the categories that they had, and we worked through those first and got that optimized before we then started to explore where we could build out that, that search opportunity further. Uh, we've got a question. Yeah. Uh, so would you have to have a page on your site that included that keyword or phrase or could it be on uh, could it be on content on your page so it, it varies so in that particular example they are individual pages for those tread pattern sizes um with the specific aim that when somebody goes through to them they can then see the products that match that tread pattern um so that they've gone through that keyword they've landed on a page that's all about that keyword and then they have a, a selection of products to choose from that are directly what they've searched for. I think it uh, in that example, that's quite a particular one because of the way that that product works. If it was something that's maybe a little bit more generic, then I think you could categorize and pull different keywords together on a single page. And as long as the intent and the structure of that content was correct, you'd be able to bring those together and, and condense it. Um, but it would very much depend on your product, how that user journey is when they get to site if there's a single product or multiple products that would target that that keyword um, and and really start to individualize what you need in that instance and in that example there where we had we did have product ranking for those trade patterns and those tire sizes but there were products rather than landing pages 
So we could rank for them with the products, but naturally that wasn't the best place to land. So we had to eventually do it. We started with a small batch of 25 or so pages just to test that it would work. And you know, as SEOs, we like to test and learn from these sort of things. And we, as soon as that started to get success and we saw thousands of sessions come into these 20 top 25, it was a no brainer to roll them out. The downside is they were a bit more manual. So we had to load them up, work with the merchandisers to get them in. But because of the goodwill of some of the other success, we got them on side to help us with those things. So it was, you know, in that case, we had to create separate pages, but that isn't always the case. You, you know, the four by four page ranks for multiple different four by four terms because of the content within it. So it just depends on the case that you kind of look against, I suppose. Great. Cheers, Rich. And um, I think a really important place to start when we talk around focusing on existing content on your site is around products and category pages. So this is just an example of a keyword search for red dresses, very generic, very top level, but you can see that pretty little thing have quite a lot of content above the fold. They then have uh, links through to different category pages and subcategory pages that are related to that, that landing page. Uh, and they rank in third position for that. What you can then see on the right is somebody that has absolutely no content on their site and just lots of products that are not performing in search and are actually on the third page at the moment for Google, which their click-through rate will be so minuscule that they're probably getting very little sessions through because of that. Um, and you can start to see here that where you actually invest and take the time to write that content and get it into the site, you will start to see the reward from that uh, and structuring that content in the right way and targeting the right keywords for that page will help you start to rank for it and improve your rankings for it. Um, and our final point on content, in, which we see a lot as an agency, is don't create content for content's sake. Lots of people create content on a blog that is completely irrelevant to their business, to their products, to their customer. This is an example from a tech retailer um, who sell phones, who sell laptops, who sell... Uh, uh, AirPods, and they're talking around the Super Bowl halftime show and have content that is related to this across their blog. Now, the reality is that that is so irrelevant to their business and their products that this probably has really low engagement on site, which is probably going to then negatively impact the rest of their content and the rest of their site. So be very aware of what you're putting on your site and make sure that when you're creating content, it's there for a purpose and a reason. It's not just there to tick a box of, we've done a blog, let's get it live. Um, and I think this is probably a really important piece of the puzzle that irrelevancy can actually have a really detrimental impact to how well a site performs. Our final SEO tip uh, is around reviews. And you're probably thinking, if you've got an e-commerce site, well, I have reviews why are you telling me that I need to focus on reviews? And I think historically, over the last few years in particular, a lot of e-commerce sites have moved forward where they've started to get customer reviews on product pages, where when somebody purchases a product within a couple of days of delivery, they get their email asking for a review. They can upload images of their products in, in many cases that get published straight onto the website. There is the opportunity for people to say whether those reviews were helpful or not helpful. And that's great. That's a really good starting point for reviews. But Google has actually released four different product review algorithm updates over the last 12 months, which means that they're putting a really strong emphasis on product reviews. And that isn't just customer product reviews. You're probably at this point thinking, well, what do you mean by that? So what Google is looking for is your opinion. And it wants to know what you think of that product as the retailer. So it wants to see uh, you demonstrating that you're knowledgeable about that product and that showing that you're the expert and, and helping people make that decision. It wants you to provide visuals and audio of your own experience with the product. So this might be someone as like an internal tester giving a review on a product and giving your own star rating, our own quality rating of that product. They want to see you basically setting yourself apart from other competitors and really demonstrating to people that you're a helpful resource on that product outside of just customer reviews. So have a think about how you can maybe start to put some of these bits into product pages that will help further strengthen and support how Google sees your reviews and how it sees you as a business and how helpful you are to that user and to that potential customer. Is there another question? There is another I can see question. you gazing over. <laughs> uh, for old content that's not ranking, do you recommend improving or removing? So it's a good question. Our approach would be to have a look at the content, 
have a look in analytics to see whether it's had a sessions over the last 12 months, have a look to see if it's driven a conversions over the last 12 months, try to understand how it's actually performing for you. If the reality is that it's had very little traffic, if it's delivered nothing for you as a business, and you don't think it's the quality it should be, then that can probably be culled and removed from the site and redirected into something else. If it is generating traffic, and you can see that within Search Console, within Analytics, and you can see that it's ranking, then that could be a really nice opportunity to potentially look at that content and either revise it, update it, expand it, and really start to, to home in on what that page is gonna rank for and what you want to achieve from that page. Don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, Rich? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose to give you kind of more uh, confidence that you can do those sort of things, we, we do exactly that at uh, and it's not just in the ties category, we do it across the whole website, we do it on our blog, um, the copy team and the, the content team are, are constantly doing content audits to identify low performing blogs or blogs that just aren't doing anything, then it's an exercise that we've been doing for, for the last two years now, and we cull the content, if it, if it doesn't perform and we don't find it, or it competes with something else, or we've got you know, 10 articles all talking about Father's Day, we just try and make life easier for ourselves and make sure that we resurface content. So it's been a real shift for us as a, as a business and credit to the content stage in there that now we're not just creating content for Father's Day every year, we resurface the same sort of things. The Black Friday, you know, we're not just regurgitating the same sort of things and then we just pull things. Um, there's all nervousness with removing content. We go, like, well, what if it's doing something? But actually we've seen our blog grow massively and substantially because we're not carrying that dead weight with us. Um, so sometimes it does actually lift a lot of that burden as well. Well, to you then, Craig, if that's all right. Well, I'm really looking forward to when another question comes in because I've been in charge of questions. So when one comes in, it's going to look like I'm talking to myself, <laughs> which is going to be fun. Um, but yeah, we'll focus a little bit on paid media. And, you know, PPC is still a really important channel. And, you know, we just um, dissected why you shouldn't neglect your organic channels. But, um, you know, what we see from the paid search point of view is that, you know, 65% of all high intense searches on Google result in an ad clip. That's because... You know, PPC itself is there to actually answer that important question at the very point of conversion. And, um, you know, you're more likely to find a, 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 your way to the product that you're wanting to purchase through a paid search ad at that point when you're searching very specifically. So, um, I don't know, Nike, Pegasus, 40, size 9. The, the ads are going to be there for you because of the way that they work. Um, and this is why typically PPC convert to 40% better than organic search. And, um, you know, it's organic's got to do a lot of work to rank and it's got to do a lot of things and it's got to um, think about how it can, how it can capture those, those bits of traffic that it wants, whereas paid search, we can be really targeted by just telling Google we want to pay to appear on that search term. Um, and 80% of search users state their PPC and shopping ads have helped with brand awareness. And, um, you know, I think, the biggest thing that we could say here is that, you know, the rise of fast fashion over the last kind of five years has, has been fueled by that um, ability to, to see those brands on the likes of, of Google shopping and, and Google search. You know, I don't think, you know, five, six years ago, misguided were anywhere near TV, for example, but they grew through that, um, through that use of paid search. So the first tip that we're going to look at is about optimizing your shopping feed. Now, your shopping feed is really important. Um, because what we want to, what this does is it tells um, Google, Facebook, whatever platform that you're going to be using shopping from, it tells them what the product's about, but also crucially, it allows the, the feeds themselves to categorize those products where they should be. Um, so what the first tip would be to, to, you know, really look at your product titles. These are just taken from what your organic listings will be for these products. So think about what you want those product titles to look like in a Google shopping tile and optimize that feed there and make sure that, you know, it's more friendly, it's not truncated in the Google shopping space. Um, apply product tagging and product types. This is crucial. This is what lets Google know what those products should be served for. So obviously we're not bidding on keywords here for shopping. Google takes the feed, understands what's in that feed, and then serves you to, to hopefully for relevant keywords. Tagging that product up in the, in the lowest possible product type is gonna give Google the right um, information there and then the third point is to create different product feed lists for different platforms that's that's massively important and um, because you know google and bing will want one set of information but facebook 
um, Amazon, eBay, the likes, they will want a completely different set of information. So optimizing for those different channels is how you're going to get the best performance from there. Like you can see here, what we would recommend is to use a feed management tool. It takes the e-commerce feed that you get from, from your site, utilizes an API that means that actually you can go in and make changes to that feed without having to mess about with all your the hard work that the organic team have put in in the first place. And then that spits out the relevant feeds to the different channels, which means that they get the feed optimized to their channel and you don't have to do any kind of work that's going to be detrimental to any organic um, search work that's gone in before that. And the key thing really is, is getting the feed right will enable shopping and, and now performance max with Google campaigns growth. Um, like I've said before, you know, understanding where those products sit and, and making that work is going to power the fact that Google knows when to save those ads and what, how relevant those ads are going to be to those users' queries. So the next tip, especially when it comes to, to Google ads and, and Bing ads, will be to structure your PPC campaigns around the objective. What are you trying to achieve? Um, so what we want to look at here is say, right, well, from a campaign perspective, do we need to hit a certain level of margin? Do we need to hit a certain level of revenue? What is it that we're looking at? So there could be number of sales, revenue, and um, return on advertising spend is, is always one that, um, that comes up with regards to e-commerce. And this allows us to structure our campaigns around an objective. Now, this is a this is a, a structure that we came up with for one of our other clients who's whose products are always around the same margin. So we don't need to bid differently around margin. So what we did was we structured it around average order value. Therefore, the higher average order value um, products will deliver the higher margin because the percentage is always near enough the same. So what that allowed us to do was to, was to segment that and say, right, well, what we want to do on a high AOV product is set a really low target ROAS in Google and say, Google, you can spend you know, within reason, whatever you like to deliver this product, because we know our margin is always higher on these. And then we change that for mid AOV, we have a mid target ROAS. And then for the lower AOV products, the products where we don't make as much actual cash from it, we set the higher target ROAS. This tells Google what priority we should place these different campaign types in and allows us to really kind of hone in on that and make the strategic shape of the traffic what we want it to be. Then we also have a campaign which is specifically for product push. So we use the custom label of the feed and our feed management solution to go in and say, right, this particular client needs us to push these, this product now because there's a new product launch coming out soon and they want to shift the stock that they've got in of the old one. We use custom label one and then we apply the same kind of proposition there in terms of giving it a lot lower target ROAS to allow Google to spend as much as it needs and get as much volume out of that product. So what we what we saw from this when we, we put the structure into, into place, um, and this is three months pre-campaign restructured to three months post, um, that we had an 11% decrease in cost of sale, and there was a 23% increase in number of sales from the same media spend, 97% increase in the, in the return on ad spend, and a 19% increase in average order value. So you can see there that, that the changing of the shape of the traffic and pushing that um, pushing that spend behind the higher AOV products really had the desired effects. The tip that we've got is to, is to utilize contextual display. Um, so what we mean by contextual display is, is to really hone in on what the users are, are looking at. So rather than targeting the individual based on the, what they've been looking at around the internet or whatever that might be, we want them to be in an article that's related to the product that we're trying to sell. The idea behind it is that customers want a better ad experience. So 74% like ads matching web, web page content, 69% are more likely to view a relevant ad, and 75% want advertisements that provide variety and something new. Um, and when they're given that, um, we get a 40% increase in ad memorability, 370% increase in brand favorability, and a 390% increase in purchase intent. Um, and again, you know, we can see some, um, some live examples here of how that looks and what we can do from a contextual display point of view. So these ads are placed right in the heart of something that is relevant to those um, particular ad copy. And you can see there, you know, the travel example and a, a couple of different um, variations on, on, the, um, on the same outfit that the person's using. 
In terms of the benefits um, of contextual display, well, it's cookie-less, and that means it's future-proof. You know, we're, we're all aware of the impending GA4 deadline. Um, contextual display doesn't utilize cookies because we're not targeting an audience, we're targeting a, the content of a page. Um, it's compliant to brand safe, so our solution adheres to the IAB gold standard. Um, it's completely unique ads. So what we have is the ability to tailor our ad copy to the landing page and specifically to certain aspects of, of um, the system that, that they're being used on as well. And high click-through rates and high conversion rates, you know, in some cases we've seen almost PPC level um, click-through rates on, on these ads, which is exceptional really. So a real world example of this is um, here for Enviraphone. So what we have is an, an iPhone 13 and 13 mini review. Um, and up above, we've got the, the, the contextual display from Enviraphone, which shows the, the iPhone 13 models and the iPhone uh, 13 prices. And uh, you know it really sits in that page and it's very, very relevant to that particular page. Um, and what this did for us was we saw kind of, you know, nearly a million unique ads. I'm not going to read the whole number out. <laughs> um, and then a 30-day cost for sale difference between contextual display and um, traditional display was huge. You know, it was a 70% difference, but this is this is crucial because the, depending on the device that's been sold and, and how the business model works, that um, £109 difference could be the difference between making profit and making a loss. Um, and then when we see the, the cost differences in terms of what we've run, you know, P max and versus uh, performance max and paid search, it's not all that different. Um, but then when you see it versus the kind of traditional display, there's a big difference there. So really, really important to make sure that, you know, contextual display is utilized in the right manner, but also don't just dismiss it um, as part of a, a wider display strategy. Really think about what you can do in this channel as the, the first touch point from a display point of view. And then the fourth bit is about the change in social media landscape, really. I think it's really important that we consider um, what's happening in user behavior. Um, and TikTok um, specifically now isn't just a social platform. And, um, you know, 40% of young people use TikTok as a search engine when looking for lunch spots, for example. Now, what we can see that we hear is TikTok have taken that user behavior and created a widget um, for iOS devices which allows you to search basically from your home screen on your phone in the same way that you would do a Google search. This is huge um, because it's a, a big shift in user behavior. So we need to make sure that you cover all of your bases with e-commerce and not just um, the traditional Googles and Bings of the world. So how do you optimize TikTok? So use keyword text overlays and make sure that you've got important keywords on your videos, because um, TikTok will read this and serve this to the user based on any keywords that the user has been looking for. Again, utilize keywords in the captions, take advantage of that 500 character caption limit and use that as your way of making people behave in the way that you want them to and take the actions that you want them to. Uh, utilize hashtags, you know, it's a, the famous social one right away, all the way back to Twitter, right through Instagram and, and the like, you know, utilize has, hashtags because that's how TikTok will work. And follow the trends, really. Make sure the content that you create and follows trends. You know, we, we, we see a lot of examples of really kind of like grandiose and polished videos that not what users want on TikTok. TikTok users want user-generated content. They want it to be people like them utilizing the product in the way that they would utilize the product. They want it to feel authentic. Make sure that that is key to what you're, you're trying to deliver. And... Basically, what this means is that you can actually now have a shop within these platforms. Make sure that is part of your strategy. Make sure that you are taking advantage of young people not wanting to leave the TikTok platform. You know, there's a lot of people there doing searches. Catch that demand in that platform. Give yourself the ability to check out on that platform and utilize that um, that volume that's there and really go after it and make sure that, you know, this forms part of your um paid an organic e-commerce strategy moving forward. And finally, like with anything, test and learn, but across every single channel as well. You know, don't be set in your ways with the budgets that you've got. You might have an idea when you set out that actually you should have, you know, 50% of all our spend should be on Google, 20 on Bing, 20 on this, 10 on that. 
don't stick to that. Follow the performance and decide where that budget should go. And um, obviously start from a, an indicative budget of what you want it to be, but don't be wet to it. Make sure that you can maneuver that budget. And especially, you know, when dealing with agencies, you know, I, I, I do work at an agency, but make sure that you have the conversation from the outset that, you know, you don't want to be wet to a single channel. If you want to be able to move budget fluidly from one channel to the other, make sure that that's, that's available to you from your agency and make sure that you can do that because you should be following performance and you should be trying to make the best out of your budget that you can. Great. Thanks, Craig. Um, so hopefully that's provided you all with some actual tangible and actionable advice there about how you can go and move on organic and paid media. Um, I think we've got a little bit of time, so we can maybe open it up to questions. If anybody has any, I will close my screen down. Maybe we covered that so well that there's not a single question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> people just felt sorry for me they want me to answer myself <laughs> yeah um i think if there are no immediate questions from anyone then um this presentation will be shared with everyone over email after this session um if anyone has any follow-up questions that you'd like to just put to us personally one-on-one -on -one, then feel free to to drop us an email um our email addresses will be included uh, with this uh, webinar uh, pdf that's sent across uh, and uh, if anyone is interested in chatting further about how potentially Trunk BBI can help support your performance, then please do get in touch. Uh, another question from Katrina, is a young person just 16 to 24 or is it a bigger demographic? Um, it's an interesting one, actually. Um, I think the way that we would generally categorize it is younger people are Gen Z um, and we then have millennials and the bottom end of that millennial uh, demographic is still within that younger generation, but maybe heading more out of it. Um, but Gen Z is what we would refer to as a younger generation and a younger demographic. Uh, and in particular, some of the things that Craig chatted around on TikTok um, and had those behaviors of using it as a search engine and actually searching for things on there rather than going to Google, that is very much led and driven by Gen Z. Uh, and them engaging and wanting video content and non-written content more so than seeing a page of, of written results within Google. Yeah, I think I think the other thing to say there as well is that you know they are the they are the first generation that grew up with technology just existing. You know, uh, millennials like like us, we kind of you know were there at the at the start when when the internet first came about. But these guys have just always known that. Um, and that's why the, the kind of the behaviors can be can be so different. Any other questions from anyone before we we wrap this webinar up and let everyone get on probably with their lunch break at this point? Uh, we've got two more. Um, so we'll uh, cover off Katrina first. Would a company like Halfords be worthwhile spending marketing on TikTok? Uh, I suppose I better ask that one. Yeah. <laughs> so we we do um, we do have a TikTok. It's it's only recently that we've had a TikTok. So we've got um, a, a really great member of the team, Laura Masters, who heads up the, the social part of the uh, of the business, and um, it's something that she introduced when she first joined. And actually, it's quite it's quite a successful channel. And it might seem a bit strange to see someone like Halfords on on those sort of platforms, but actually, Laura's done a great job of embracing it. So our retail stores, our garages. And we've got some really great ASMR videos in there that kind of show you know, people with handbrakes and stuff like that. And it's really creative and different. It just gives us a different way of kind of engaging with those sort of, those sort of audiences, especially when, you know, new learners and new drivers and things like that might be thinking about how and they'll see us on TikTok with all these quirky, interesting videos. Um, and then we do put paid promotion behind it. A lot of our paid stuff is where we get a lot of the, the views and the, obviously the interaction. Organic social is hard to crack and talk to Craig will say the same sort of thing. So a lot of our paid advertising is in social spaces as well, particularly Facebook, Instagram, and, and those sort of areas. But TikTok's been good for us. I think just to just to add to that, we've so this afternoon we've actually got our kind of quarterly business review meeting with Halfords. And as part of that, we like to, to come up with suggestions about what else they could be doing to help further strengthen tire category performance, along with some other categories. But one of the suggestions for uh, this quarter is very much going to be looking at how we can create video content that aligns to tire searches on TikTok and Google. So Google actually pulls in TikTok videos ahead of YouTube videos in some instances now uh, within its search. 
and we know that people are a younger demographic in particular are searching on TikTok. How can we merge those two together to really start to drive more from social in relation to tires? So things like how to check tire pressures rather than a 40, 60 second video that sits on YouTube. How can we create a quick, you know, eight to 10 second video that can be published on TikTok? And that when somebody searches for that in TikTok, that type of content is being served to them. So I think that's where Halfords and TikTok can really start to kind of join together forces and, and also blur the lines between channels. Um, we have a, another question from Lee, uh, which is with product uh, category content, is it more important from an SEO point of view to have it at the top of the page versus the bottom? And then a second question, which is having too much content at the top pushes the products below the page fold. Does this create any issues with conversion rate slash UX? So I think to answer the first question, um, in our experience, content above the fold on a page performs better than it does at the bottom. If you think that Google and other search engines read a page as a human would, top left to bottom right, within the UK anyway, and within English, um, really content above the fold is always going to perform and be read and seen as more uh, higher priority than Google than anything at the bottom of the page. I don't know if you want to add anything there, Rich. Um, yeah, I, think, I suppose from, from that perspective, Lee, the, the problem that we always had at Halford is the same sort of thing. UX don't want the content, they think it looks ugly and it, and it interferes with, with the user. So we did lots of tests to see what difference it would make. It's never definitive. We've obviously optimized all the pages in different ways. But in generally speaking, the best performing products and pages on our website have content both at the top, the middle, and the bottom to just give it more weight. Um, but we let it be interactive, and from a conversion rate UX perspective, we've never seen conversion rate go negative. If anything, it's probably helped improve it because we've got more sessions that are more quality and probably more um, kind of tailored. Um, we actually use lots of options as well, for like accordions, drop downs, open, read more, collapses, and all that sort of stuff. So make good, good use of those things to just help keep the stakeholders on, on the UX side of the business happy that they're not just bloating the page with loads of reason content. So there's clever ways you can do it these days. Yeah, I think that's a really important point as well. What you said there around having content, not just at the top, but at the middle, knitted throughout that page and at the bottom. I think, you know, if you went and wrote an essay for a category page at the top and every, every single product was below the fold on desktop and quite a long way down on mobile, then that, yes, will potentially help the search, but you're right, that will probably detrimentally impact conversion rate. You need to find a happy medium of having the right content initially to help Google and the user understand that page, but not necessarily take away the uh, uh, the spotlight from those products that you're ultimately trying to sell and get people to purchase. So you need to find a happy medium there. Um, so hopefully that one answered you questionly. We have another question from Chelsea, which is what site speed should I be aiming for to be competitive? Uh, and that is a really interesting question. And we get asked that a lot as an agency. Um, and from an agency perspective, my answer would be that it's not necessarily about a definitive figure that you need to get to. If you're using some of the Google site speed tools where it'll give you a score out of 100 for site speed, it's not about necessarily getting to 100, 90, 80, because the reality is less than like 1% of websites get anywhere near those figures. What's important is understanding who your core competitors are, understanding what their site speed scores are, and trying to be competitive against them. So if your competitors have site speed scores of... 40 to 50, then your benchmark should be to get in the same realm as them or better them, not necessarily to get to that, you know, 80, 90 mark, because it takes a lot of work to get to that. And there's very few sites that do get there. Um, obviously, you need site speed to be of a certain speed to not impact conversion as well. So I think um, there is a graph that Google float around quite a lot which shows conversion rate based on every second that a site takes to load. The sweet spot that Google talk around is getting a site to be interactive and functional after three seconds so that a user can then use it for its intended use. Um, and there's lots of clever ways that you can do that to get to that, that score point. But some of the things that we've chatted around here today around you know, optimizing images can be a massive step in improving that site speed performance and using formats like WebP instead of JPEGs if you have seven or eight different product images on a product page, if they are all a third of the size of a JPEG, then you're going to cut out a significant amount of load time there. So there's lots of clever things you can do that are not particularly difficult to improve site speed, but it's all about being competitive against 
your benchmark and your key competitors. Don't know, Rich, again, if you've got anything to add, anything from Halfords. I know site speed is, is a, always a challenge. <laughs> yeah, I suppose from, from my perspective, um, you know, we we probably fell foul of the same sort of thing, really. We were chasing a number, like five seconds, six seconds, four seconds, three seconds, whatever it is. And actually, reality is you don't really know why you're chasing it. The tools don't really give you those sort of measures as accurately as you probably want them. So now what we do a lot of the time is just see, can we continually get better and better in that? You know, now it's more about core web vitals and those sort of things rather than a, a certain load time for us. Um, but it's part of our development. We're never going to be perfect. There's lots of new changes that happen to the website, lots of new releases, development work that will slow things down. It's really about doing things that we can control so we can say things. Images have been a massive focus for us. Page layouts, templates, lazy load, JavaScript, all this sort of thing, just refining them as we go. Um, you know, you're probably not going to get to, to the end of those journeys, but it's just about getting them as best as you possibly can and keeping your army competitors so that it doesn't impact conversion rate too heavily. But yeah, don't chase a number if you can help it. Yeah, nobody needs those numbers. <laughs> Um, so I think that's that's all the questions that were put in. So uh, unless anybody's got anything else to add, we'll we'll call this webinar day and we'll let everyone go off for their lunch now. Um, but thanks everyone for your time. It's been really great to chat to you today. Um, and like I said, this will be shared with everyone uh, after via email. And if anyone has any follow up questions, please feel free to reach out. But yeah, thanks everyone for the time and yeah, have a great rest of your day.